Hey, today is September 11th, 2017, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 57. Today, we find out if Alexa has the skills to pay the bills, what dolphin attacks mean for our smartphones. We're taking a look at the future of self-driving cars across the U.S. and the importance of designing for security. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Let's do it. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. What welcome back. What was that? <laughs> to another episode of Human Factors Cast. <laughs> I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined over there by Mr. Blake Arnstor. Well, welcome everybody. How are you? Oh man, it's a Monday. It's it's gonna be tough to get through this one, man. Like we were talking about before the show, we are both really tired. Yeah, so, it's a uh, Monday evening. It's been a long Monday, but I'm glad to be back on Human Factors Cast. Nicholas, how are you doing, man? Well, man. First off, I have to say to all of our listeners down in Florida, please stay safe. We are thinking about you guys, and um, you know, there's there's a lot of help out there. Hopefully. You are some of the people who get that help um, and just help others if you see them down there because, man, you, it's looking bad. It's looking bad for Florida. So stay, stay safe uh, and please come back next week and, and you know, hopefully, hopefully you'll be around to listen to Human Factors Cast many, 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 many weeks from now too. Wow, that sounded really dark. But uh, no, seriously, guys, stay safe. Um, yeah, stay safe. Listen to the radio. Whatever you got to do, but yeah, uh, get out of there. Best wishes to all of you out there for sure. A quick side note: I don't know if I um if I put this in the show notes for next week or not, but there was a story that came out today about um, Tesla uh, unlocking the battery for all of their cars, so that way people can get to safety. So if you're so fortunate enough to own a Tesla in Florida. Uh, you can get a little bit further. That's just a little PSA. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. Who knows? But Blake, let's let's kind of get on a happy note here. What's going on with you, buddy? Oh man, so I'm so excited this week. I have more hot dog ban hot dog banter, if you can believe it or not. What is with this hot dog banter, man? It's like it came out on one of our shows, and it's just been going. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it was kind of just a, a funny coincidence. But so last week. I went to a speak up here in Sandy or <laughs> speak up. I went to a meetup for UX Speak Easy here in San Diego uh, that was partnered with a company called Metaverse. And so what Metaverse is, is it's a it's like a company that has both a kind of web application which you could think of as kind of like Visual Studio but for building augmented reality apps. Um, oh, so you neat. like you we would get in groups and we would log onto the system and build like an augmented reality app. And then it had a companion version on your, for your smartphone where you could actually go and use the augmented reality app that you had built. Um, and in this case, I actually have not seen the show in a long time, but we, we built the hot dog detector from the HBO show Silicon Valley. Oh, which is basically okay. just another AR app that can detect whether a hot dog is in your environment or not. So, super awesome, lots of fun, very cool to build AR stuff. Man, hot dogs are everywhere. What uh, what kind of technology were you using for the uh, hardware? Uh, the hardware, like literally all of the stuff is done through your phone. Oh, okay. Like, so, that's, there that's all the hardware. Yeah. It's, there wasn't any HMD or anything. It was just... No, okay. no, no, no. And it was really cool because like the uh, the actual studio that you work on through the web app or through the website, I guess, in the studio piece is very simple. Like it's it's a bunch of modular pieces that all do like specific long lists of like JavaScript code instructions, but it's all done visually. So it's laid out like you build each interaction for the app and then you can test it out in the out in the real world as an AR app. So it was overall just a fun experience and plus I got some hot dog banter out of it. Well excellent. And you said this uh this the software that you were talking about, that's called Metaverse, right? Yeah, I, if if I remember right, their site is metaverse.io, and they're a local startup in San Diego. Oh, excellent. Well, I'll have to check them out because, you know, that's right up my alley. Um, <laughs> yeah, most definitely, man. Well, that's cool. Um, I, You know, so, okay, so check this out, man. Over the week, uh, over the weekend, I guess, uh, I, Southern California people like to speed, 
a little bit sometimes. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a thing. It's kind of like a fact of life here, right? So uh, here's what happened, man. So I was driving along, and um, I see police, police lights up ahead. And I was like, oh, man, what happened? What's going on? Uh, you know, I hope everything's okay. And, um, you know, slowly and slowly I get closer and closer to these police lights, and I realize, I, I realize that this is not a police vehicle at all, but these are just police lights and they are attached to one of those um uh one of those devices that measure your speed right that uh kind of say you're going too fast you're going to you know you're going oh, okay got you right yeah. right so it flashed the police lights at you if you were over the over the speed limit to kind of indicate you know you you could get pulled over for this theoretically and i i really sat to think about like wow that is that is really cleverly designed because when you see the blue and red lights on a police vehicle, you like your your stomach sinks. You're like, oh crap! Like, what did I do? Um, oh yeah, your stomach sinks. Your foot hits the brake. I mean, that's exactly. a perfect like. Uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of tapping into people's mental model of those specific lights and specific colors. Yeah, that's that's pretty sneaky. I it like was, it. Was it was, and I I really thought about it. I'm like, wow, somebody actually thought about that at um, you know, w- when they're putting together this uh, traffic safety these traffic safety devices and, and um, studies from the uh, TSA or the, the traffic safety administration. Is that, is that a thing? I'm pretty sure that's a thing, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, th- somebody actually thought of this and, uh, and actually made it and got it okayed and it's out there. And that was, that was pretty, pretty incredible to me. I, th- I, I thought, I mean, like, I don't know. I, maybe I'm just overreacting to it, but I thought it was like really cleverly designed, and I I just appreciated it. No, that's not an overreaction at all. Because at first, when I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, maybe there's just like yellow caution lights. But that's crazy that they would actually, you know, use the blue and red police lights. And it, and if it's far away, it makes a whole bunch. Or if it's far enough away, it makes a whole bunch of sense. That you'd be like, oh man, that's not good. I needed to slow down. Right. Right. Yeah. So well, it actually had the opposite effect on me, right? So I saw the police lights far away, so I slowed down. And then once I realized what it was, I sped up so I could see the lights. Uh, but but that was purely for research purposes for this show. So, you know, Surely. T- yeah, yeah. Take it as you will. But uh, those may be hitting you uh, sometime soon. So I don't know. Uh, it, let us know if you see those out there. Um, do you have anything else, Blake, before we start to get into these news stories here? Um, you know, I really don't have any more banter. The hot dog was all I got, bro. What okay. do you got? That's okay. I just, well, I just want to say that, you know, HFES, uh, Human Factors and Ergonomic Society annual meeting is in one month, almost to the day. I think it'll just be wrapping up around this time next month. Um, if you guys plan on going, please holler at us. Let us know. Uh, we are happy to meet up with you. I'm going for sure. We're still, we're still figuring out Blake here, but, uh, you know, and you're hosting a panel, aren't you, Nick? I, well, I yeah, I'm uh, chairing a session, uh, Virtual Environments Technical Group 1. Um, Do you guys hear how just casually he says that? That is so awesome, man. <laughs> but, I mean, please, please, stop by. If you want to say hi, uh, I'll be at the gala. I'll be hanging out around uh, around the convention convention the conference floor i always do that for some reason (laughs) convention conference that's all fun to me that's why um so anyway yeah i'll be i'll be hanging out if you see me please don't hesitate come up and say hi love talking to listeners and uh you know getting those human factors uh conversations going so uh yeah please please stop by and you know if you want to even set up a thing with us please just feel free to email us and and uh we'll be happy to do what we can so uh, anyway, let's go ahead and get into Human Factors News. Now, this is uh, the part of the show where we talk about, you guessed it, Human Factors News. Now, this could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, whatever, design, as long as it does, it <laughs> relates to the field of Human Factors. It's a Monday, Blake. What do we got up first this week? <laughs> All right. Coming at you fresh this Monday, we're going to talk a little bit about of Alexa and Amazon. So, Last week, Amazon launched a new feature for Echo and Alexa-powered devices that allows Alexa to make suggestions of third-party skills when she responds to certain questions. So now, if you ask Alexa to do do something that she's not capable of, she'll point you to a skill that can perform that task instead. Before, if you wanted to find a skill that was suited for your needs, then you had to browse through the Alexa skill store on the web or in the Alexa companion app. 
But now the virtual assistant knows that the voice apps written for her platform, what they can do, and will make suggestions if she thinks there's one that can help you with this question. So, Nick, I think we're going to rename the show and call it Human Fortune Telling Cast. Because you and I both called out the need for something like this based off of a story last week. It, yeah, it was almost it was very serendipitous. We launched the show last week, and then this article comes out the day after. Uh, because, yeah, we had, we had talked about the need for something like this. And then, uh, yeah, the next day this comes out. And so we're just continuing that thread from last week. This is great, and I think it's a great first step, and it just shows how far we still need to go with this, um, you know, virtual assistant, voice assistant technology. Because the fact that this wasn't a thing, well, first off, it's amazing that Alexa can even know what you're intending to do and browse for a skill. The next step is to automatically install that skill and launch, you know, the functionality of that skill um, all in one go. Oh, okay. So that's that's interesting. So y if you use this hypothetically, you might have to like only be redirected to that specific skill, and you'd have to install it for Alexa. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So the way Alexa works is, or the way these Amazon Echoes work is, you have a, a, a skill store, and it's almost like an embedded app store uh, within the Alexa app, and you kind of go, "Oh, I want the Daily Show app," and um, it will, you know, if you say Alexa, launch the Daily Show, it will do uh trevor noah's monologue or something you know so so it 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 has these very specific skills um that you have to actually go in and activate so so right now uh there's not anything that will say you know like if i say launch the daily show she won't do anything because i don't have that installed but you know with this update um if i say launch if i say uh what's the daily show got or something she'll be like i don't have that but here's the daily show you know and i i i really need to get an echo dot just to hook up into the uh into our soundboard so we can actually see what she says and test some of these stories but but that's that's the idea now right she won't actually launch the daily show but she'll say there's an app that you can use uh and that's that's kind of the way it'll go okay yeah so we're s so even though we're seeing like an incremental improvement from what we talked about last week, right, about people having to like physically go in and figure out, OK, is there something else that Alexa or Siri in that case last week could use to accomplish this task? We're still a little bit like having a so, well, not the biggest barrier to entry, but still you have to install something in order for it for Alexa to actually just do it on her own. Yeah, she wouldn't just like hear you say this, install it and then start doing it. Yeah, and there's a there's a kind of quick fix to this. If she were to ask, "Would you like me to enable it?" right? That would be that would be a quick fix that would allow people to sort of just in one go kind of um activate these skills that are needed, right? So, I mean, that's 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 a great way. point though, Nick. I mean, because I'm sure the the reasoning maybe it, right now you have to still go in and physically click and install things for Alexa would probably have something to do with you need to both acknowledge that you want to download it and probably accept potentially i would i would guess some kind of like user terms or TOS, agreement yeah. so maybe by acknowledging it verbally like yes Alexa, i want you to download this that would kind of take care of that step yeah potentially um i think you know there's there's a lot of barriers to this and it's it's good that they're starting to at least uh introduce ways that at least alert the user of potential ways to um to remedy certain commands that can't be completed due to you know them not having the skills activated or whatever you know so it, yeah it'll be interesting to see where it goes like i said we need to get to that point where it just understands what you intend and automatically kind of does everything for you that's that's the dream yeah that's definitely the dream but i think this addition of her kind of asking you secondary questions beyond just saying like, Oh, I can't do that. Um, or I don't know what you mean type of thing kind of almost gives it a little more of a human like quality. Like, well, I don't really know how to do that right now, but here's some things that could help you do it. So I, I think it's an awesome step in the right direction. And it's just kind of ironic that we talked about it last week and already there's something completely new. Yep. Yep. I, yeah, I thought the same thing. All right. Well, uh, what do we got up next? Cause I think, uh, we're still talking about Siri or Alexa, right? 
Yeah, okay, so that was a little bit of good news on Alexa's front, but I have some bad news in general for virtual assistants. Uh That is, hackers seem to be able to take control of the world's most popular voice assistants just by whispering to them. What? Yeah, it's ridiculous. All right, so, that's right. This week, Chinese researchers discovered a terrifying vulnerability in voice assistants that affects all of the heavy hitters, including Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Samsung. It affects every iPhone, every MacBook running Siri, and any Galaxy phone or PC running Windows 10 and Amazon's famous assistant, Alexa. It's all due to what is being called a dolphin attack, where vocal commands are given at a ultrasonic frequency that is too high for the human ear to hear, but perfectly decipherable by the microphone and software powering our always-on voice assistants. This relatively simple trans translation process lets others take control of gadgets with just a few words uttered in frequencies that none of us can hear and i can't even fathom how somebody thought to research this and found this vulnerability like it that part really blows me away yeah so uh i mean yeah i i'm (laughs) i'm kind of blown away by this as well just because the fact that I mean, you had to. You have to think there's there's some sort of hidden commands with these things. I don't know, man. I'm like still. I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around all this, and it's really, really scary that you know just with frequencies they can take over these devices and uh, you know give it commands. Yeah, and I mean hashtag dolphin attack. That's the funniest and scariest line that I've ever seen. But it's it's crazy that they're using ultrasonic frequencies to hack just a plethora of different technologies made by different brands. Like they even have an example from the article where in a car, I think it's like in an Audi, it's navigation system can be redirected by using this ultrasonic frequency hack where it's just basically giving somebody a whisper um, to like change the route. But it's, it's tough because this really calls again for the need to think about security of technologies as we build them oh god we'll get to that in a minute <laughs> yeah I, I know yeah we, we really dive into that in this entire episode it feels like or at least for a couple stories um but you know i i kind of wanted to get your thoughts on something that's mentioned in the article it's like it's kind of like a statement from from one of the design directors from a, a security company you down for that yeah 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 let's go so They talk a lot about that Silicon Valley has basically designed these human-friendly UIs with huge security oversights. And again, think about this from a security company point of view. And they go as far to say as from like a UX point of view, this feels like a serious betrayal. But on a serious note, I mean, even through a plethora of user testing across these devices. And we're talking about big companies. We're talking about Google, Apple, Microsoft. How would any company really have caught this outright, especially when so many of them use this always listening function for their, like their virtual assistants? Yeah. I mean, there, so I can speak a little to this, right? So in, in functional testing, they do a lot of, does it work? And what, are sort of these corner cases where, you know, the the most unlikely thing will happen. And I don't think it was even in their, even in their thought process that something like this could happen, right? Because they were probably testing with voice and they were probably using computer generated voice maybe as an extreme case to where, um, you know, they were probably testing the, types of phrases that go into this thing or the the different accents that go into this thing but i don't think frequency was one of those things that they were testing or maybe it was and this was you know completely apparent to them and they just thought you know no one's ever going to use this so i I don't know man yeah i just i i didn't like the fact that i I guess the companies were kind of being called out as like missing this big thing in ux and i really I really have seen through different talks and articles that come out, I, I swear, like weekly, that like security and design is just something that's having to become 
we're just having to really think about. Like, I feel like there's been a very big emphasis on what functions can you provide me? How good does it look? How many people can it reach and how quickly? And be, because we're able to get different apps and different pieces of software out the door so fast. I mean, of course they're going to have vulnerabilities like this. Um, so I don't know. I, it's, it's kind of, it's tough. Cause like you said, I don't know that you would have caught this in testing or if they did, um, and just left it there. I mean, that's, that's kind of strange. Cause I, I don't know. I would assume they would, they would make the jump that if somebody caught it, they would jump into it. But I, I think the luck here is I'm assuming is that this was found through research, not actually like exploitation. Of right, right, this right. Hack. Well, okay. So I'm okay. Help me break this down. So it, does this actually give the voice assistant commands? So like if, if I were to say, Alexa, turn on the lights, right. And pitch that up to oh, above 20 um, kilohertz, right. Pitch that up. Is that the the type of commands that they're giving to it? Uh, or, yeah, I mean, I think it just uses pretty much whatever the keyword is for the virtual assistant, and then it has to be. I, I'm assuming it has to be existing like phrases that it can, you know, do something with. It can't be something out of the, like, out of the woodwork. So it would have like, let's say for an iPhone, you could say like, "Hey Siri, call X number." Right. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I'm I'm trying to think of the applications in terms of, you know, this ha- this smart home, uh, it would be you know the the worst they could do is maybe order something on Amazon or uh, call my parents who have an Amazon Echo as well. Like that would be the worst uh, possible thing they could do. And but I mean, yeah, if if you have a device like a cell phone where you know you have a bunch of personal information on there credit card numbers, uh, emails, passwords, all those things saved to a device. Um, I can imagine that there could be much more damaging uh, sort of commands that could come out of that. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the one that, because we got like a list of basically hack, hacked examples from the article. And I think the only one that presents a real kind of danger is with navigation systems. Actually, they're in mm-hmm. cars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, but again, I'm unsure, and I know they break it down a little more in the article, but I'm unsure like how you would set all of that up. Like You'd have to have so much prep to get the speaker system in the car and hidden away and just all that kind of stuff. But you never oh, sure. know. I mean, there are crafty people out there. Yeah, it's something good to be aware of for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. This is It's crazy to me that these invisible commands can can sort of hijack these devices that we interact with every day. I mean like I I get yeah. I I'm I'm blown away by it and you know we there's <laughs> last year's theme at HFES was we need to get on the cybersecurity thing because of stuff like this and because of stuff like our next story. Are you ready to move on? Let's do it, man. Okay, well, before we do, let me just thank all of our friends over at Kotaku, uh, TechCrunch, Recode, and FastCo Design for our stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us on social media. We post those links as we find them to keep you guys up to date. Uh, so you can brush up on what we're talking about ahead of time. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? It's the big one. Uh, Everyone's talking about yeah, this one. This is, this is a big one. All right. So calling again for the need of more thoughtful design when talking about data security, the credit reporting service Equifax announced a doozy of a data leak Oops. last week that when all is said and done could involve more than 143 million consumers. So in short, this is definitely bad. The treasure trove of information included social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, and in some instances, even driver's license numbers. As though that weren't bad enough, 209,000 people had their credit card information information leaked, and the breach also included a dispute dispute documents with personally identifying information from over 180,000 consumers. And let's just pile it on one more time. Although the majority of the information leaked was from the U.S., a percentage of the information was also from citizens in the U.K. and Canada. All right, Nick. So you and I will definitely get into this and break it down, but I just wanted to throw a little disclaimer out there for anybody who may not have heard this. So Equifax, in lieu of 
this data leak has set up a website, and that is www.equifaxsecurity2017.com, where you can check if your data was leaked and to what extent. The company is also offering free credit monitoring and identity theft. So, again, check it out. Make sure you know what vulnerabilities you have and take advantage of this if you can. Well, hold on, though. Hold on. Before you do that, I hope you didn't pause this episode and go do that. One caveat to that. Uh, so there, an article came out the other day that they are hiding uh, terms of service in that breach, you know, check if you're, you're affected uh, website as well. And the, the biggest sort of uh, caveat to it is that if, if you do enroll in their identity monitoring and to check if you're even affected, you are waiving your right to a class action lawsuit. So I don't know, take it with a grain of salt. I did it before I saw that. So, you know, there's so many people affected by this. Uh, who knows what kind of money you can get out of it? Maybe a couple bucks, but you know, just, just to be aware. That's, that's a that thing too. Is... Sneaky. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's not cool. That's, that's hiding some, that's almost like some dark UI, UX pattern, right? Like yep. hiding some of the rules by giving you things. And then oh, I have man. to say anyway. though, I have to say though, that's pretty clever. I mean, on their part, right? Sneaking something like that in there. Oh boy. Oh, I mean, it's absolutely clever. This is devastating for their company in terms of, I mean, not only just data security, but people's trust in this company. And I mean, we use this, we, I don't know, I have used Equifax to do credit checks on my on my credit before. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, my Every information year. is definitely out there. It's one of the major companies that does that. Ah, goodness gracious, dude. I can't even fathom how this happened. But on the other side of it, I kind of can. Because this is probably built on older technology that may have more vulnerabilities they weren't ready for. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. You know, at HFES last year, there was this big push towards trying to figure out cybersecurity because... <sighs> Man, I just uh, it's so frustrating, right? Like we trust these people with our information and then something like this happens. I just don't I don't get it. I don't get it. Sorry for the little chime listeners. That was uh my Google Drive is full. <laughs> you didn't hear it Blake, but but our listeners heard a little chime and that's <laughs> that's my Google Drive is full. That's all right. Oh man. So I don't honestly Nick the problem I had reading this article is what do we do to even improve this? Yeah. I mean, look, so here's the thing. The there's from the human factor side of things, there's not really much we can do. Hackers will be hackers and they will get this information, whether we like it or not. Right. And like the, the human factor side of things is more dealing with phishing attempts and social engineering. And how do we sort of, you know, bring this, this type of, uh, information to the everyday user and how, how can we prevent them from being affected by knowing what's going on, right? And we really can't do anything here. It's really frustrating because it's just all this data locked in some database that hackers managed to get access to. But that being said, they had to get access to it somehow. And so somebody's information somewhere being at, at Equifax or or not. I mean, I I think what happened probably was they got access to somebody's account in in the company who had access to this stuff. And so maybe maybe it is a human factors issue where we take, you know, training and and we train employees to not be susceptible to these social engineering attacks. Um I data was a brute brute force uh attempt. I mean, we we don't really know that much information about it right now other than wow, it affects a lot of people and uh it's got a lot of personal identifying information out there. Like that's all yeah. we know. We have no idea how they got to this, but I, that would be my guess is that it was some sort of social engineering attempt and and uh they uh they mined it. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I can think of is I, I like your idea about the training for sure because, I mean, the, the better you train people how they deal with passwords and information they have access to and keeping it in only their hands, not letting other people see it or transmitting information through public accounts, that kind of stuff. Like, those kind of security practices are definitely one to use. I mean, the only other way I could think of getting around it in this case 
is specifically requiring maybe authenticator authentication from any time you want to log into anything. And if it if it happened through Equifax, I mean, we still again like have no idea if that was the case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you there, know, I, I mean, there are some security measures to take. I mean, you could use authenticators. You could require passwords to be changed like on a very regular basis. Um, yeah, but I think those are some of the problems that we have to solve as human factors practitioners. Those are the thing. Those like getting people to change their password every every month or something like that is a big pain in the ass, and we shouldn't have to do that, right? But we should still be able to access our stuff in a reliable and secure way. And so, how do we provide ways to do this without? You know, I mean, I think the two-factor authentication is definitely one of the better solutions. Uh, it's it's a little annoying to get, you know, to have to go to two separate places to validate who you are, but it is much more secure, right? I have two-factor authentication for everything that allows it, every single. Oh thing. yeah. So, and I mean, I've been I've been pretty protected since. So I mean, like. I don't know. It's just, it's one of those things that we need to figure out as human factors practitioners. And who knows? Maybe there are, I haven't looked at the program yet for HFES 2017, but, you know, I think that there may be a couple, uh, there, uh, there may be a couple panels or, or, uh, what, what am I thinking of? Panels or uh, posters that, that have to deal with, uh, with human factors at HFES this year. So that's something that we can we can definitely check out. Yeah, hopefully there is, because, I mean, there's always going to be, or I feel like as the future keeps going, the emphasis on security and the design of it is just going to get more and more required, especially in big companies like Equifax that deal with so much data and how do you protect it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there will even be, like, designing of, like, relational databases, like, down to that level of trying to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, only time will tell, but I, I hope to find out some more information about this soon, about how they got in, about what their methods were. It could have been a brute force attack, and really there's nothing we can do for things like that. All right, why don't we go ahead and move on to the next story? So the next story, we're talking a little bit about self-driving cars. Self -driving so the, House, cars. the U.S. House of Representatives has approved the self Drive Act, which, if it moves through the Senate and becomes a law, makes it possible for companies working on self-driving cars, like Ford and GM, to be able to field as many as 100,000 autonomous test cars per year. So the proposed bill allows these companies to bypass some of the safety standards that currently apply to human piloted cars, like having steering wheels or even gas pedals. This legislation would supersede state-by-state -state rules, making it possible for autonomous testing to proceed on a level playing field across the United States. This is so cool, Nick. I can't even... Well, we've seen a lot of legislation over the past few months about, specifically, I think, the Self-Drive Act. Um, and I, I think this is finally now moving through the House and going to the Senate, and that's why we're seeing it again. But I didn't realize that they were going to actually propose something that would allow these car companies that are testing cars to be able to get by state by state rules so there's not so much complication within each state when they're testing these autonomous vehicles this is so cool yeah you know i've been i've been really tired of the political climate not being able to pass anything or or just our attention has been elsewhere and it's amazing that something like this has actually been passed and is actually getting out there, you know, to the next um, step. Like, it's it's great that we're finally getting to a point where we, we can work together on something, whatever your politics are. I mean, it's, it's just nice to finally see something that we're working together on. <laughs> like, but yeah, the fact that this is a self-driving legislative act that will allow... Um, you know these these uh companies to to sort of bypass these regulations. That's great. I mean, autonomous vehicles have such different demands, right? Like you don't need uh, a steering wheel in an autom automate or uh, self driving car, right? You don't need that. But you know the law 
up up until now or up until this thing gets passed, you know, would dictate that you do. And so it's nice to see that they are opening up, allowing uh, self-driving car uh, manufacturers to sort of get their needs addressed. Um, the fact that they're even paying attention to this sort of rise in technology is a good sign for me. Yeah, I think it's a good sign for a lot of different kinds of people in different fields, especially because this has the... So the implementation of self-driving cars in general has the notion that it might change how we view just transportation at all. Like, And this comes from like just getting from work and home to even transportation of goods across, in this case, the United States, but potentially later on across the world. I mean, this is going right. to change the paradigm about how we view cars. Uh, and But it's never going to happen if we don't get get them out there and allow them to be tested across like a, a, a large playing field where we can see how, how people interact with, let's say, if I no longer own a car and I need a ride to work, like using some kind of Uber or Lyft type service that sends me an automated vehicle and gets me on my way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's great news. I I really am excited to see where this will go. Um, so this uh this this has moved through the House. Now it needs to go through the Senate, right? And and if it does that, then it will become law that uh, basically, yeah, we, we can we can basically do whatever we want with self driving cars within reason, basically, right? <laughs> Is that what I'm understanding? So the um, yeah, I I agree with you, Blake. I think it's going to revolutionize this industry, every industry, really the the distribution especially, because now instead of having you know, truck drivers, you'll have autonomous trucks that will transport something across the country or from a distribution center in a matter of hours where the human operator would need to take a, a rest in between. They, you would have to deal with vigilance and fatigue with the operator. And now that would be potentially no more. You just need somebody to um, unload the truck at, at the destination and load it at the distribution and then you're good. And I mean, like you said, too, with the commuting, like that's, you know, Uber, Lyft, whatever, everything there, you can see applications for, um, you know, you don't even have to pay drivers anymore. You just pay for the vehicle and gas and uh, it becomes a whole lot less expensive. So, or, I mean, if you want to even get like just a little bit deeper, think of it being as part of the tax structure in your state. Because it's it's if it would be that wide that people could use it almost like a public transportation system through autonomous vehicles, and then like let's let's take it one crazy step further and think about here in L.A. with Elon Musk and his idea for the tunneling system. What if that's all automated cars that are using this really fast system? I mean, now we're cutting down travel times with potentially large amounts of traffic, but. Like, I don't know. It's it's kind of mind-blowing where all this can go, but, of course, it's got to get passed in the Senate. Right, right, right. And so that's the real we'll challenge. See that. I, 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 would, I would think we would. I mean, this is this just has the power to create create a lot of jobs and advance technology, like, beyond where it is now for autonomous vehicles. I agree, yeah. Hopefully, uh, those fine folks in the Senate <laughs> will, uh, you know, see this as a, a, a necessity and, and pass it. I mean... I, I love seeing stories like this, and we've been following this one for a while, and uh, it just seemed right to kind of follow up on this thread. Um, but I think we're almost done with the news stories this week, aren't we? We got one more, right? Yep, we got one more. Let's get to it. This one's my favorite one. All right, cool. This one's a fun ender. So we're talking a little bit about video games. So as we all know, games lie to us all the time, and recently some game developers took to Twitter to share a few of their favorite lies that games tell us. These lies reveal design tricks used in games like Surgeon Simulator and Bioshock. And the thread came about when the, lead, the design lead on Opaque Space's Earthlight called on other developers to share examples of the small ways they tried to manipulate players' perceptions, citing the way that Assassin's Creed and Doom make your last sh shred of life slightly more durable than it should be in order to keep things tense without triggering defeat. 
The overarching theme here is that every game tries to play with people's expectations and instincts in order to shape a more interesting and fulfilling game experience. I don't think it could have been said any better than that because this is, it's really cool to think about how video games shape an entire person's experience because it's, right. it's like completely different from a way we design almost anything else. Right, yeah, no, you're right because, okay, winning is fun, but winning just by you know by default is not fun you want a challenge but you don't it's this article was so cool to me and i had to post it because as a ux or human factors uh designer or engineer right you are designing these experiences for people and a lot of times you are designing for simplicity you need to get that user to do the sweet path Um, the golden path, whatever you call it, you need to get them to get from point A to point B um, as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible to make them feel like they're doing something. And in video games, it's completely different, right? Because you're designing... The the whole reason the player is even in the game is because they want to experience something. It's it's, It's the everything in between A and B. It's not A to B. It's everything in between. Right. So so you have to sort of design these experiences to be fun, entertaining and um, and challenging all in the same go without frustrating the player. Although some games like Bloodborne and and Dark Souls are built on that. Right. Or uh, or without frustrating them or without uh, making it too easy, you know. So um, I want to jump into some of these examples because I thought some of these were really clever. Right. Oh, so, for sure. Hop in. Yeah, so so let's just go through these. Uh, so in Bioshock, the first couple bullets fired at you by enemies always miss. Um, so that th- their reasoning behind that kind of builds a false sense of confidence um, that you can. Yeah, run which in- is awesome because it allows you to kind of like feel like you're doing really well when maybe maybe you're not, but also gives you just like, hey, I'm pretty good at this game and I can make it. I can this rush versus in. Just- yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, they they uh some of these some of the all uh jeez, I'm looking at all these ones. Some of the other ones um you know, they only have the people in front of you shooting at you. I'm just going to kind of go through these rapid fire here. Um Oh, it's so, okay, go ahead. So the what what the one I thought was really interesting cuz I was pretty stoked on this game coming out was from Shadows of Mor- or Shadow of Mordor, right? Yeah. And this was a really cool I don't know, instance where you have to make a decision about what the product's going to actually do based off the interactions you're trying to build in. So they they had had, from like the lead designer of the game said that for spe- specific enemies, you would change the health up and down um, based on like how, how it was going like throughout the duel, right? So their their health would go back up uh, just just so they didn't die like too easily, kind of like we were talking about, that balance between being really hard and being really easy. Right. Um, but in order to make it feel more epic, they decided that there was the better way to go about it to create a more immersive experience was actually to add more cut scenes and stuff like that instead of like changing how the gameplay went because potentially people might feel cheated if they thought they beat a character versus not. So it's just a it's kind of a cool dynamic between what they're getting at of manipulating perception. You know, let me let me get to my favorite one here because. This, there's some ethical implications with this one, and uh, I want to. This I, is gonna be spicy. Yeah, I want to get your opinion on this, right? So the the competitive shooter scene, that's a thing. Oh yeah. So in Gears of War, uh, they found that ninety percent of first time players don't play a second multiplayer match if they don't get a kill. <laughs> that first game is very important. So what they did was they started you off with some major advantages like additional damages, uh, damage bonuses that tapered off with your first few kills. What do you think of this one? Okay, so this is really hard. If anybody doesn't know, I have a super open love affair with Gears of War, the entire franchise. I think it's great. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not very good at multiplayer. And so it's easy to get super frustrated playing because there are some people that are just so good. And with matchmaking, 
in my opinion, I don't. It's been a while since I've played four or three, but in my opinion, the matchmaking is not like sensitive enough to know like okay this skill set matches with this skill set let's put them together so it's more of a competitive fun playing match like you can get in there and there's just people that are so good that maybe play competitive or just like play more often than you that it's not even that fun to hop into multiplayer matches so i totally get this um i don't i don't know it's it's one of those things where i'm super nerd enough that to get better I hopped on YouTube and found out that you should like go play with AI bots on really hard and get your right. aiming better. So that's what I did. And I don't know that I necessarily agree with changing the mechanics to uh, like um, to facilitate people playing more than one match. But that's if it's tough. only for those few matches, I don't know. Maybe it makes sense. It gets some more users, greater retention. Maybe there's going to be another Gears of War. So it, it's a it's a complicated question. It's very complicated, and my, here are my thoughts on it. So, so I don't think it's unethical because everybody has that first match, so everyone's gonna get this. Uh, that's that's point one. Point two is that it tapers off. It's a slow decline after the first few kills, right? So it's not permanent. If it was permanent, or if it was in the background, kind of subtly adjusting skill level to be on par with the really good players, I think that might. Uh, be a little bit more unethical and and cause a few more um, a few more potential uh, problems with the game, right? But but I think as it stands, I think that's it's a clever trick. And I mean, I it's something I've always wondered about the statistics surrounding multiplayer, right? Because I've I've kind of felt like I've experience this in games too like i start out really good and then i get really shitty as you know time goes on and uh you know if there are secret things like this behind the scenes i would like to know about them but also it's yeah it's a it's a really kind of shady trick well yeah it kind of is but i mean even in so there's a lot of things like this and it's it might be in gears of war too i mean there's even times where you play games i know it's in call of duty for sure where you can't use specific types of equipment based on how far you are into the match when it starts like it for instance like throwing a grenade or something like that isn't allowed because over time they've seen that users have found the hacks of if you throw it at this right correct angle right at the start you'll get a bunch of kills that right. normally nobody would get right so they try and like they change the game mechanics based on what they learn over time. Right. Uh, I, and, you know, I like the fact they're using it to increase retention. I do, too. Yeah. Well, I mean... But I, th I do agree with you. I think it's kind of shady how they've done it. So I want to get to one other one, and then and then we can get into the... the um, I, I want two more, because these are really cool. Okay, so Half-Life 1, if you're facing more than two enemies, only two would actually attack. The rest would run to random locations and bark lies for example, flanking. So that's kind of interesting. Um, it doesn't overwhelm the player with enemies. Uh, you kind of focus on, you know, um, who's actually attacking you. And then I think it's awesome because it, it's, it's what I really thought about throughout this article was how cool it's got to be to design like tiers of play, like, um, like from casual to like hardcore modes, how fun that's got to be to try and design and tweak. Oh yeah, yeah. I would imagine it's very fun, and like there's there's a bunch of different things. Like like I said, it's it's not from A to B. It's it's the journey from A to B. It's not the destination. Um, and the last one I want to cover here is Surgeon Simulator. They uh, they hid many features to incite cu curiosity, and I'd be curious to see what other features they're talking about here. Uh, for instance, if you dial your real phone number in the game, it calls you. What? Yeah, so that's another one that I want to try now. I want to go into Surgeon Simulator and just dial my phone number and see if it works. Or, you know, instead of dialing my phone number, I could dial 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you, if you want to leave us a voicemail. I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, <laughs> seriously, like I want to check that out in Surgeon Simulator. That's pretty cool. That's another thing I love about game developers, and it's it's kind of like another design-esque thing, is that when they leave Easter eggs in games like that, or small things that like not everybody's going to find, but a target population of people is going to figure it out. It's kind of like oh, yeah. playing Call of Duty Zombies. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right, man. Well, I think uh, we beat these stories to death. We got about 10 minutes. So let's go ahead and jump in to uh, our community outreach. We got an email. You want to, <laughs> you know, let's cover this email here. It's from Kimberly Young. And uh, she writes, hello, HF cast. Uh, I graduated from Michigan State University with my bachelor's in packaging. Yes, packaging in May. Uh, I focused on design, but also learned about distribution, manufacturing systems, uh, material, etc. While on co-op at a pharmaceutical company, I got to work on some human factors projects. I since realized that the medical healthcare human factors is far more in line with my interests and career goals than packaging. Uh, I spent the last couple months trying to learn all I can about human factors on my own. Online resources like Human Factors Cast. Hey, shout out to Human Factors Cast. Thank you. (laughs) Have been helpful, and I'm currently reading Universal Methods of Design to fill in some of my methodology gaps. I also have some Human Factors related experience. I did some UX research for an app that never launched and spent 2.5, two and a half years uh, for (laughs) two and a half years in design for America, a student run human centered design studio that leans heavily on user research. My problem is, okay, here we go, Blake. My problem is it's hard to tell what would be expected of me in an entry level human factors job. Can I put together enough experience and self-education on my own to break into the industry? Should I take the more traditional path and get my master's right away? Is there another option I'm not considering? Any help would be very appreciated. Thanks, Kimberly Young. Well, thank you for writing in, Kimberly. Uh, we love it when we hear from our listeners. And uh, this is a this is an interesting one. I've never met anyone that got their bachelor's in packaging. Have you, Blake? Well- No, but you know, what she describes that she learned is like talking about distribution, manufacturing systems and materials. Like I know that there's actually a lot of process engineers that look at how manufacturing distribution run, make it more efficient. They use a lot of human factors methodology. So that's really interesting to see that as a bachelor's degree. Yeah. uh, Yeah, for sure. Um, So first off, let's get into the experience here. So two and a half years in design for America um, human centered design that leans heavily on user, presumably two and a half years here of user research, which is good. Uh, there's, there's some experience right there. Um, looks like they are, she is reading books to fill in some of the methodology gaps and, uh, looking for resources like us. So I think that's all good. And you have a background that kind of fits the bill. Um, a lot of people will tell you it's all about the experience, right? It's all about, uh, what kind of background you have, and as long as you frame it in the right way, I think I think you could get away with an entry level position right now. I think, um, you know, I think if you put together a portfolio of what you've done and and try maybe for an internship first and see if you like the work environment. Um, I mean, if you already spent two and a half years at Design for America, it sounds like uh, you've already been exposed to that. Um, I'm I'm a fan of the master's degree route. It it kind of broadens your horizons a little bit, uh, and you will be so immersed in the um, methodology and and the content in a master's degree program. That's like diving feet first, right? Uh, you'll definitely figure it out that way. But I think there's enough there to get you into the entry uh, level position. What What are you thinking, Blake? Okay, so I have. Probably too many thoughts, but here, here's what Let's I've got. Them. So that's, that's Kimberly, why they write them you in. obviously have some great experience, um, and you have a unique perspective, I think. So if getting a master's is not a financial burden to you, I would definitely recommend it at this point, um, because you, especially since you want to work in the medical field, and here's why. So looking in a lot of the job postings now, there are like Nick's talking about entry level human factors positions, or you might even find some internships that you could grab, but a lot of them are looking for people with master's degrees. Um, and this will, this will help you get your foot in the door. It'll also help if you can find a master's degree program that's looking at specific research that's done through medical technology. Um, and there's a, there's got to be at least some resources online. Maybe we may all look for some and try and, uh, send them back out to you, but that would be a route I would go if you would like to go ahead and get start get started working. I definitely have the same sentiment as Nick. You have the experience. All you've got to do is put a portfolio together that'll 
show the process that you use because you obviously have UX research experience. Even if the app didn't launch, that's not so much a big deal. It's what you did, how you did it, how you made decisions, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the design for America, I mean, that, that's that got to look good. I mean, if you did it for two and a half years, you may be even able to pull out multiple portfolio projects. Um, the only other comment that I have for you really is uh, I was just going to recommend another uh, methodology book, and that's uh, Designing for the he- User, or sorry, Measuring User Experience, and that's by Tolison Albert. Yeah. Um, uh, but I- yeah, I think you have a, I don't know. I, I think you're going to have an awesome career in human factors if that's really what you want to do. Um, I don't know. I think I, you got some cool experience already, and you're obviously trying hard outside of school now to learn everything you can. So that's awesome. Yeah, that is. And I have one last piece of advice. Uh, HFES is next month, and uh, nothing nothing gets you a job better than connections. And if you go to a conference that is in your field, you know, maybe it's not HFES, but maybe a, um, a health and human factors conference. Um, I know there's a few of those out there. If you go to one of those and make these connections, um, those are by far more valuable than anything else, right? If, if, uh, and to second the master's degree route, if, um, if you get into a master's degree, chances are you will make some pretty good connections there. So, you know, don't don't rule it out entirely, but it I, I those connections are are pretty important as well. So if uh, if you are at HFES, feel free to reach out to us, and you know we'll we'll be happy to talk to with you. And and uh, you know what, if you're listening to this and and have any other questions, feel free to reach out. We are more than happy to answer anything else you have. Um, but let's go ahead and switch gears and get into it. Came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. Any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to the feel of human factors and encourages discussion. Uh, So we got two entries today. Let's go ahead and get to this first one here. Oh, man, I'm going to mess up this name. (laughs) What, uh, Blake, do you want to take a stab at this name? Because I am Ornithornicus Anat? Uh, That's the best rendition of that ever. Ornithornicus. Ornithornicus, Ornithornicus, and Nat writes: Our design schools teaching UX schools UX skills yet? Uh, was wondering if schools, if RISD, SVA, Cooper Union, FIT, have figured out to add UX design and research into their curriculum. If so, do you think that will have a negative effect on UX boot camp grads? Now, I never went to school for design, so I don't. I don't really have any. Uh, any sort of knowledge on this. I don't know if they're teaching UX design. Um, I work with a few people that, at you know, they, they've gone to through the UCSD program uh, and uh, they, they learned a lot about the ux stuff, but I don't know if they ever taught them any UX-specific things. Blake, what are you thinking? So I rope in a lot of human factors methodology into... A baseline skill set that kind of props up UX. I mean, taking the specific like graphic design skills as a secondary piece, like, the methodology behind it, I think is a big thing. And I, I had a little experience actually at the UX Speakeasy meetup that I mentioned. I met a guy whose undergrad was an HCI, and what he described that he was learning in class, both from a design perspective and methodology. Like that, he basically took a class that mirrored my first job uh, at Pacific Science. Like I had to learn wireframing tools and how to deal with users and how to take all this disparate information, turn it into some kind of UI, and then continually measure it once it had been launched. So I have to say that I, and if I think I'm getting at the spirit of the question here, uh, but I have to say that yeah, I mean, bigger schools are getting much more honed in, even in the undergrad level, of teaching these kind the methodology behind user experience design um, both from like a strict methods and analyzing research perspective and uh, just design skills because like the, it talks about Cooper Union and I know another one is Jared Spool's um, oh, yeah I think it's I only know the acronym it's UIE uh, center center uh, wasn't right? there they a whole, teach hang on, really a quick. lot of analytics about UI and how to think about that kind of stuff so 
wasn't Jared Spools, uh, wasn't his thing like I'm I'm teaching how to create unicorns that do everything? Wasn't that? Yeah, his? that's that's definitely his idea. Yeah. So what I have to say about the last point um, is I I do, in my opinion, think it will have a negative effect on UX boot camp grads if and only if once you get out of one of those boot camps that you don't continue to push yourself and learn what's what's getting bigger, what are the design trends, is there changes in methodology, like keep learning once you get out of them so that you stay competitive with other people that might be younger than you that are getting the opportunity to go to undergraduate programs or master's programs that focus more on maybe user-centered design or design thinking. Well, Blake, that that was a pretty comprehensive answer there. I'm I'm glad you had a lot to speak to that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think I came across an article like this on Twitter at some point, and I said the same thing. So I was I was pretty prepped for it. But I I don't, I don't know. I think I don't want I don't want people to get discouraged getting out of a boot camp and worrying that they're not going to be as as good as other people. You just have to keep pushing. All right, man. Well, we are running up against our time for this week, so maybe we'll go ahead and save this last Reddit question for next week. What do you think? Sounds like a plan, man. The next one I would probably go on for days about. All right. Well, we can go on for days next week. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of our stories this week. Did you like them, hate them? Let us know. If you have any suggestions for stories you think we may have missed, you can follow us all over social media and hit us up on Twitter at HFactors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud. Uh, We're on LinkedIn, Facebook as well. Uh, Or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com, just like Kimberly Young did today. Uh... You know, and if you're feeling really saucy, like I said, dial us up in Surgeon Simulator at 901 646 1432. That's 901 646 1 HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon if you like what we're doing and want this to continue happening at patreon.com slash human factors cast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you so much for hanging out with me on a Monday night and helping me break down all the stories in Human Factors News. Where can our listeners find you if they want to interact with you? Oh, Dick, it's always a pleasure, and thank you for being a great host. Thanks to Kimberly Young for reaching out to us and also for all the Reddit questions. You can always get me at Twitter on at Don't Panic UX for any of your UX, human factors, or hot dog banter questions. I'm so glad you said hot dogs. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rowe. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome for all your human factors or Star Wars questions. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. Oh, it depends. It depends. What do we have this week? It depends on what? The hot dog banter. Hot dog banter. Game developers and Equifax sucks and design flaws. It depends on if Big Daddy's looking at you or not. And Alexa! Turn off Human Factors Cast.